that photo is the last thing that anybody will see of her alive. I started getting these texts. Have you seen this? The police scanner had lit up. They were talking about a girl who was found on Valley Road. The marks on the throat, the bruising, they were consistent with a homicide. Without a confession, the investigation could go on for months, even years. When the case broke, it broke big and fast. When the story starts to change, that's a pretty good indicator that someone's lying. Here's your key piece of evidence, and it's in a picture on Facebook. I was in shock. Like, where did this plot twist come from? March 2015, Saskatoon, Canada. A picturesque town straddling the Saskatchewan River. 18-year-old Brittany Gargle is a senior in high school with a bright future. I met Brittany in eighth grade. We were in gym class and we had to be partners and we played dodgeball and after that we found out that we lived five blocks away from each other and we would always hang out. I just thought she was kind of bubbly and hyper and very friendly and outgoing person. And I like that about her. Me and Brittany love to do our hair, makeup. Every night she'd knock on my window and we would sit outside and talk and she'd bring pizza and Slurpees. She treated me like a sister. If I didn't have money for anything, she would hand it to me. If, I, if she didn't have anything, I'd give it to her. She was just somebody to lean on. Brittany also impresses her friends with an unusual level of responsibility for her age. She was 17, she was working full time. She was going to school full time and she had goals. She was definitely driven to get what she wanted. She wanted to build and own her own hotels. I knew right away that this girl was going to go places and do things. Despite her sunny disposition, Brittany had a difficult childhood. Her mother struggles with addiction, and she grew up not knowing her father. Brittany, growing up, she lived with her grandma. She was such a kind lady, made sure she always had what she needed. She definitely wanted a, a relationship with her mother, but she understood that there was circumstances that she couldn't change. Brittany, she was doing really good, had her job, and doing everything that she needed to do. She was, seemed really great and that she was doing great in life. On March 24th, 2015, just months before graduation, Brittany makes plans to go out with 18-year-old Cheyenne Antoine, a good friend she's known since ninth grade. Cheyenne, she just seemed like a quiet, nice girl when I did meet her. They would go for walks and hang out outside. Brittany and Cheyenne had developed a close bond because they both had difficult childhoods. Cheyenne had this history where her, her folks had died. She was raised in the foster care system and then suffered sexual abuse. Early in the evening, Brittany and Cheyenne stopped by Atasha's house. And I just lent Brittany some gas money because she needed to get around. And then I told her to be careful, you know, if you need me, call me and I'll come pick you up or whatever. And she gave me a hug and that was it. That was my last interaction with her. Just after midnight, 
Brittany posts a selfie on social media with Cheyenne. They're at her grandma's house getting ready and dressed up for their evening out. Brittany was just, you know, I think she was just happy to get out and hang out with her friend. And Cheyenne looks like she's just ready to go party and Brittany just looks so relaxed and just ready for whatever life is bringing her. Six hours later, at 6.02 a.m. on March 25th, Saskatoon Police Radio Dispatch sends out an alert. That particular morning, I was already out at the scene of a shooting, and the police scanner lit up. And when they switch to their emergency channel, and when they talk about a female injured and or in distress, you knew it was serious right away. At that point, I bailed out of the scene I was at and uh, drove out to that area. I had to go see with my own eyes while it was still a fresh scene. A motorist spotted a young woman lying on the side of the road in a remote area near the Saskatoon landfill. Initially, on an outdoor crime scene like that, you need to protect the scene as, as best you can to preserve evidence as soon as you get there. The victim appears to be in her late teens or early 20s, has no shoes on, and her body is cold to the touch. By the time I'd gone out there, they had set up a cordon already. I could only get to within about 100 meters of uh, where the body was. Paramedics try to resuscitate the unidentified victim and rush her to the hospital. but she's pronounced dead on arrival. Police immediately suspect foul play. The signs that she was a victim of a homicide were pretty obvious, the marks on the throat, the bruising and all the injuries that were consistent with a homicide. At the crime scene, investigators find several potential pieces of evidence a leather jacket, a belt, and a woman's watch. The fact that her body was found on the outskirts of town raised a lot of red flags for investigators. My first instincts were that it was uh, it was like a sexual predator type murder. There was no immediate suspect. There was no motive. There was nothing there. Because I've covered crimes like this in the past, I thought this was a body dump. If I've hurt somebody and want to dispose of their body, this is the first natural point where you would throw a body out of a vehicle because you've just cleared the last neighborhood. Nobody's going to see you there. It seemed pretty clear to me, based on my experience, that this is not where the person had had the bad things done to them. So right away, you had a scene that was not the crime scene. I think there's always that kind of concern about, is this an isolated incident? Is this random? The killer is on the loose. That's often where my mind goes when I start to get into an investigation and start to cover crime cases. Hoping to identify the victim or get leads to the killer, investigators release photos of the items found at the scene. They also release pictures of the victim's distinctive tattoos. I think I turned the TV on around 7, 7.30, and I turned on the news. They were talking about a girl who was found on Valley Road, and I was like, wow, that's just right down the street from where I live, and they said that they're still trying to identify her. I started getting these texts, have you seen this? And then I looked and I'm like, there was the jacket, the tattoo, the line, the two stars. And I'm like, oh my God, that's Brittany. My heart sunk.
I literally dropped on my couch and started crying because I was like, this is no way. She was just here not even like nine hours ago. And then I ended up calling the police station and I said, I know who it is. And they asked me to come down. I went down to the police station right away and did a statement and I just, I couldn't believe it still. Like it was just unreal. Like I almost couldn't fathom that it happened, but it happened and I couldn't stop crying. Those images, the jacket, and the broken watch. I couldn't get those images out of my head because she was wearing those things when she left my house. So they had the identification fairly quickly, but that's all they had. Like, why? That was the last night of her life. That photo is the last thing that anybody will see of her alive. Investigators key in on an unusual murder weapon. That belt may well have made the marks on her throat that caused her death. And focus on an unlikely suspect. I was shocked because of who it was. Regardless of how improbable or salacious a story, they have to take it apart. And that's why we, a lot of us started thinking, maybe, you know, this is going to be one of those unsolved mysteries. Police in Saskatoon, Canada, have learned that a murder victim found dumped on the side of the road is a local high school senior, Brittany Gargle. This was a young woman who didn't fit the image of someone you would expect to find dead on the edge of town. She wasn't living on the street. She had stuff together. She had jobs. Uh, she had a family. She had all of those things. When detectives learn from Brittany's family that she was active on social media, they delve into her accounts, looking for insights about her life and perhaps clues about what led to her death. The police found the photo of Cheyenne and Brittany together, the selfie on the Facebook page. It was the last photo of Brittany Gargle. They had a selfie posted of them on Facebook six hours before Brittany's death. Detectives also discover a heartbreaking Facebook post by Cheyenne, made hours after Brittany's body was found. She was posting on Brittany's Facebook wall. Where are you? Haven't heard from you. Hope you made it home safe. Police want to talk with Cheyenne to learn what she can tell them about Brittany's activities on the night before her body was discovered. They don't have to look far. Prompted by all the news stories about the murder, Cheyenne comes to them. Cheyenne Antoine called police and she told them what had happened the night before. And she basically said that she was with Brittany, it was a party night, they went to a few bars. So there is a timeline starting to be created leading up to when Brittany's body was found. Cheyenne tells police that on March 24th, around midnight, she and Brittany started partying at Manchester's pub. A couple hours later, Cheyenne says they went to a house party. And by 4 a.m., ended up at the Colonial Pub and Grill. They apparently met a guy there. Brittany asked him for a lighter, invited him along. Cheyenne describes him as a white male, about 30 years old. But she doesn't know his name. After that, Cheyenne said that she got dropped off to visit her uncle and that she didn't ever see Brittany after that or had no idea where she went from there. And she actually gets her uncle on the phone to corroborate this story, and he, yeah, gives the same information.
As investigators begin trying to identify the mystery man Cheyenne says she last saw Brittany with. On March 26, the day after Brittany was found by the side of the road, the results of her autopsy come in. It was clear that Brittany had not been sexually assaulted. She died of suffocation by ligature, basically strangled to death. From the patterns on her neck, it wasn't a rope or a shoelace, but it was something else that left unusual marks. One of the items of clothing that was found alongside Brittany's body was a belt. And the belt became a very interesting part of the case because they believed that the belt was the murder weapon. That belt may well have made the marks on her throat of the ligature that caused her death. Brittany's family doesn't recognize the belt as belonging to her. Detectives send all of the items found near Brittany's body to the crime lab for DNA testing. When the results of the DNA tests come in, they show traces of Brittany's DNA on the belt, along with one other unidentified individual. One week after Brittany's murder, family and friends attend her funeral. Despite the injuries she suffered, her family wants an open casket. Walking in there was hard. I seeing all her high school friends. And we got to go up and say goodbye. And it was really hard because she didn't even look like Brittany. Her face was, it was different. It was so swollen from the damage that you literally could not recognize her. And it was really hard to say goodbye. As Brittany's friends mourn, detectives continue to follow up on the information provided by Brittany's friend Cheyenne. They visit the bars she says the pair went to, hoping to find surveillance video of the man Cheyenne says she saw with Brittany. Everything you do is on camera now. And it's such a big part of, uh, of homicide investigations now. The bars do have security systems. And the footage confirms that the girls pulled into the parking lot at the first bar, Manchester's Pub, at midnight, just as Cheyenne reported. Then, investigators move on to the final bar Cheyenne says they visited that night. Cheyenne told the police that Brittany left in the early morning hours with a male individual from the Colonial Pub and Grill. The story was that she left with a male acquaintance. The police, of course, checked the surveillance videos from those two pubs. But when police scour the video from the Colonial, it tells a very different story from the one they heard from Cheyenne. They don't see any sign of Cheyenne and Brittany. When Cheyenne said they were at the Colonial Pub and Grill and that Brittany left with another male, police knew that wasn't true when they watched the surveillance videos and that simply did not happen. They were not there. Police hunting for the killer of 18-year-old Brittany Gargle are reviewing hours of surveillance video from the last bar she is thought to have visited on the night of her murder. But they can find no images of either Brittany, or her friend Cheyenne, or the man with whom Cheyenne says she left the bar. Well, geez, they don't turn up on any other surveillance video. That really threw people. Police are now very suspicious of this, this narrative they've been given. And what they did is start going through Cheyenne's story and looking for inconsistencies. 
That includes taking another look at Cheyenne's claim that Brittany and the man she met at the Colonial Pub gave her a ride and dropped her off to visit her uncle around 4 a.m. on March 25th. A story her uncle corroborated. So detectives obtain the security footage from the assisted living facility where Cheyenne's uncle lives. They examined those surveillance videos and that was not true either. So her story was starting to fall apart. So then they go talk to her uncle. And he cracks. And he basically says, yep, my niece made me make it up. Because the real story she gave me was a lot more intense. And he's going, I don't know if this happened. This is just what she told me. Cheyenne had told her uncle they were out at the bar that night. And that they essentially went back to a motel room with what she described as two black men. And she told her uncle that they got into some kind of argument over cocaine. Cheyenne goes to the bathroom. When she comes back out, Brittany's on a bed. She has marks on her neck. And she's apparently dead. And one of these guys holds a gun to her head and basically tells her, you have to help me get rid of her. And then she went to her uncle's house. Detectives are immediately skeptical of the story Cheyenne's uncle claims she told him. I think what's problematic for the police is, regardless of how improbable or salacious a story Cheyenne Antoine is offering, they have to take it apart and dismiss it to their satisfaction. You have to investigate it. You have no choice. That's the, the definition of what a police investigation is. You have to be able to say, you know, actually, we did check this out. We looked at the video, and there were no black drug dealers at the Colonial. There were wherever the hell you were saying you were that night. It just doesn't add up. Cheyenne's second story, two black fellows killed Brittany, was thoroughly investigated. And that clearly did not happen either. That didn't make a lot of sense. Neither of those stories panned out. There was no evidence to support any of them. Cheyenne's inconsistencies and outright lies earn her another interrogation. On May 5th, five weeks after Brittany's murder, detectives interview her again. But this time, they meet at the Saskatoon jail. Because Cheyenne has recently been arrested for shoplifting. She was not willing to share anything with the police. She wouldn't talk about that evening at all. That made it difficult. But with her various stories, and her various stories not checking out, it became obvious that she was a suspect. I remember them saying, so they are looking into Cheyenne. And then my heart just dropped. How is that possible? I was in shock. And I just looked at my partner, and my partner looked at me, and we both were like, she was in our home a couple times. Like, what happened? Where did this plot twist come from? Despite her conflicting stories, investigators have no evidence connecting Cheyenne to Brittany's murder and no obvious motive for her to have done it. Even though you strongly suspect a person of the crime, you have to keep a clear mind and not get so laser focused on the person telling uh, the falsehoods that you get basically tunnel vision and you miss a possible suspect. 
without any witnesses and no apparent motive. It, it was pretty clear this was a going to be a, a tough case to crack. Two months after Brittany Gargle's murder, police have identified her friend Cheyenne Antoine as a suspect. Based on the misinformation Cheyenne has told them about the last night of Brittany's life. But they have no evidence yet to support those suspicions. Police are very tight-lipped about investigations here. We do not know really anything other than what they want us to know in the investigation stage of something, and their reason is always because it's under investigation. Everybody was getting very upset. They couldn't understand why is this taking so long. And that's why we, a lot of us started thinking, like, Maybe, you know, this is going to be one of those unsolved mysteries. All right, what happened? Like, why does nobody know what happened? Like, this could happen to anybody else. It just drove me crazy. Then, Brittany's family receives a phone call from out of the blue from someone who says they want to get something off their chest. A relative of Cheyenne's, her auntie, admitted that the night that Brittany died, Cheyenne had driven up and was in a panicky state. It sounds like it was such a chaotic night. Cheyenne was drunk and obviously dis... Good decisions weren't being made all around. Cheyenne was drunk, crying, upset, saying she had strangled her friend Brittany. Brittany's family immediately reports the call to the police and investigators quickly track down Cheyenne's aunt. She confirms the story and breaks open the case. And that was one of the big leads that police had been missing. The aunt's damning story convinces investigators that they finally found Brittany's killer. But there still isn't solid enough evidence for an arrest. Anything the aunt said would have to be solidified by evidence. With no physical proof that Cheyenne killed her friend, police are now hoping for a direct confession. But even when confronted with her aunt's story, Cheyenne continues to deny that she had anything to do with Brittany's death. It was really frustrating. Without a confession from the suspect, an investigation could go on uh, for months, even years. The fact that Cheyenne wouldn't give a statement to the police made it difficult. She wouldn't talk about that evening at all, other than the lies that we know that she told the police. Under Canadian law, detectives need stronger evidence than the aunt's story to obtain a warrant for Cheyenne's arrest, or even a DNA test. On how long it took, it felt ridiculous, but... I understand at the same time, these are not things you find out overnight and it is, takes quite a long time. On September 10th, 2015, six months after the murder, Cheyenne posts on social media about how much she loves and misses her friend. It presents like somebody who's really genuine and worried about their friend. She posted that long paragraph about, you know, I hope whoever he is, he's found. I knew there was something more to it, just didn't see right. Cheyenne's Facebook comment pours salt in the wounds of Brittany's loved ones. And it also adds to law enforcement's suspicions of her. 
It just must have been maddening for them because they would know we've, we've got so much, but we don't have it all. The case drops out of the headlines, and to those outside of the investigation, it appears to go cold. I mean, nobody was talking. Everyone was kind of wondering what had happened with Brittany Gargoyle's death. The Saskatoon police kept a pretty close eye on Cheyenne. They knew where she was, they knew what she was doing. The police are very diligent investigating serious crime like this. They just don't stop. As part of that effort, detectives decide to take a fresh look at all of the evidence they've collected and they discover a small detail in their files that they now realize was previously overlooked. And that's where the uh, selfie picture comes into play. A very, very important picture. When investigators re-examine their case file in the murder of Brittany Gargle, they realize a key piece of evidence may have been hiding in plain sight. The selfie that Brittany posted just hours before her death. We had the photo of Cheyenne and Brittany together six hours before she died. And if you look closely, Tucked in the bottom corner of that photo, Cheyenne's wearing the belt they found at the scene. It's this thick black braided belt. It's quite distinct. I mean, you wouldn't have thought anything about it if you had just regularly looked at that photo. It's not sinister. It just presents like two smiling friends. I think that was like an aha moment. When the case broke, it broke big and fast. Here's your key piece of evidence, and it's in a picture on Facebook. It doesn't get much better than that when you're trying to prosecute somebody for murder. It's like uh, playing poker where you, you turn the cards and the whole deck flips. They went from having nothing to having everything. The discovery gives the detectives the evidence they need to order new DNA tests on the belt. It has both the girls' DNA on it. It substantiates the theory that the belt was the murder weapon. That essentially Cheyenne used that belt to strangle Brittany. Now that they have the evidence they've been looking for, tying Cheyenne to Brittany's murder, detectives bring her in for one more interview. You should always attempt to get a confession. It lets them tell what happened in their own words, even though you, you investigated and you have a clear picture of what happened. But Cheyenne still will not confess. In fact, she still refuses to talk at all. Cheyenne was just shutting down at that point. Maybe it was weighing on her. Despite her continued silence, police finally have enough to arrest Cheyenne for second-degree murder. It was shock and happiness because we finally had some answers. So I was happy about the answers, but I was shocked because of who it was. We honestly thought it was just, she lost her friend. And we all felt bad for her. Now it makes me angry. Don't know how she slipped through the cracks for so long. It was, 
just shocking. After her arrest, Cheyenne tells detectives she is finally ready to talk. She basically said it was a party night. They had gone at least to a house party that had been corroborated, and lots of drugs and alcohol were being used that night. By all accounts, both women were intoxicated. They went to a few bars. She says that her last memory is at 4.30 in the morning of being in a McDonald's and that she remembers, she didn't really use the term getting into a fight with, but Brittany getting frustrated over something. She doesn't remember what happened after that, but she couldn't deny that she was the person that killed her friend. She said she woke up and knew that something bad had happened between her and Brittany. But she was just so unable to accept it. And so instead she chose to try to deny and mislead. And and I guess maybe that's easier when you really don't remember what happened. It really, really makes you second guess every person in your life. Now it's like I go and look at my friends and I'm kind of scared. So I can't hang out with people alone due to the fact of what happened to her. As Cheyenne's trial approaches, Canadian Crown prosecutors face a unique challenge. One of the frustrating things about her not really admitting what she did, there was no motive. She didn't offer a reason as to why she killed her friend. It's one of those cases where we really didn't get an answer as to why this happened. And that has a lot to do with drugs. The fact that Cheyenne was so intoxicated that night that she can't remember killing someone, like, I think speaks volumes to the unanswered questions of this case. What could have made Cheyenne so angry in that moment that that's where her anger went? So all of a sudden, this notion of culpability is a little more unclear. There's no clear motive. And the Crown, by law, is obligated to go through a checklist of factors to take into account. Her family circumstances, education, addictions, poverty, all of that. Sometimes you just don't know what the motive is and and no one will ever tell you. It doesn't make sense why a person kills another person or commits a horrible crime against another person. And sometimes there is no motive. You're just evil. after the murder of Brittany Gargle. Her friend Cheyenne Antoine is charged with second-degree murder. Cheyenne claims that due to the drugs and alcohol she consumed, she has no memory of the night that Brittany died. As her trial approaches, prosecutors believe they can prove Cheyenne killed Brittany. But to maximize her sentence, they'll also have to prove she intended to murder her. The fact that Cheyenne wouldn't admit what she did to the police made it difficult to prove criminal intent. Second degree murder is a murder with full intent to kill. Manslaughter can have the reduced intent to kill. We accepted the plea of guilty to manslaughter on the basis that she was drunk at the time. Cheyenne Antoine is sentenced to seven years in prison. She is eligible for release in 2024. The 
Seven years actually is the ballpark for manslaughter in the sentence in Saskatchewan. And I've seen it as low as two years. Still, Brittany's loved ones are devastated. She was a wonderful person whose life was cut short, and it's, it's not fair. It's just not fair. We thought it was bullshit. She was given so many chances. What more do you need to see that this person is not going to learn? People have gone to jail a lot longer for killing their dog or cat. That does not make sense. Why is she getting a slap on the wrist? She's still young enough to go out there and live a full life, still have a family, build everything and anything that Brittany will never have. Brittany's friends are in disbelief that Cheyenne could forget strangling her. I think she knows and remembers what is playing it off as, I was inebriated and I'm going to use that card. And I don't think that's fair either. They also struggle with how long it took for police to connect the dots and make an arrest. It felt ridiculous. We're not going to look at a picture and be like, oh, look, there's the murder weapon. But it, it was a little frustrating that it, the answer was right there. The existence of the photo and why it took so long to really definitively connect that to Cheyenne, I still don't really quite know. But I think the numerous attempts to mislead police certainly did not make the investigation straightforward they would have had to follow a lot of false leads. And that takes time and resources. And I mean, we don't have a huge police service here. So it's uh, one of those things where I think they just had to eventually get the right things to crack. And that eventually happened. The fact that it was a friend who took Brittany's life is especially difficult for her loved ones. But they are determined that her memory will live on. I miss her bubbly, happy, positive personality. I miss her quite often because I see her every day. I don't tear up every day, but I still, once in a while, I do get a little bit emotional thinking about back in the day with her, what she could have been now. I just feel saddened that she's missed out on her life. I got to hang out with Brittany two weeks prior to everything that happened to her. We got to sit in her car and catch up for a bit, talking about our lives and where we are and how uh, we're so surprised how much we're growing up and about uh, being the people that we are. When I'm walking by the river and going for walks, every day it reminds me of her. Brittany was a very loving person and she did everything she could to make another person happy. I'm glad that my last memory of her was her smiling and hanging out and laughing. <laughs>